Hey everybody, welcome to CAF World War II, the show where we talk about World War II, aviation, history, and so much more. World War II is produced by the Commemorative Air Force, the world's largest flying museum. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and honor through flight and living history experiences. The CAF began the Warbird movement more than 65 years ago. And thanks to the support of individuals like you, we continue to grow strong. We hope you enjoyed this episode. And now our host, Steve Buss. Thanks for watching and keep them flying. Good evening and welcome to CAF Warbird Tube. This is episode number 150 of uh, Warbird Tube. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about a very special project, the People's Mosquito. We will uh, bring our guest on in just a moment. But before we get started, as always, if uh, you could just do us a favor, if you haven't already done so, please take a second to like, share, or subscribe and uh, follow us. And if you do uh, get the subscribe button on YouTube, just click that bell icon and you will get notifications when new episodes of Warbird Tube are posted. Now, Warbird Tube is made possible by the Commemorative Air Force. To find out more about the CAF, our events, our aircraft, and how you can join the fun, just visit our website, commemorativeairforce.org. I think some of you are going to have some questions as we go through our presentation tonight. If you do, just type those into the chat box and we will save time at the end to make sure that we get all of your questions answered uh, before we sign off. Joining me now from his uh, aviation cave uh, <laughs> in England is uh, Ross Sharp. He is the Director of uh, Engineering and Airframe Compliance very fancy title, but more importantly, you are getting to work with one of the most uh, fascinating airplanes of World War II, and that is the de Havilland Mosquito. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with CAF, it really is. Well, tell us a little bit, I know you have a, a very comprehensive background, but maybe just a couple of highlights for your uh, from your from your career, just to let folks oh. know that uh, you kind of know what you're talking about. Okay, um, very quickly, I was Deputy Air Show Coordinator for the Royal Air Force at Royal Air Force Finningley and Royal Air Force Waddington, uh, running uh, number two inside the structure that ran the largest uh, event for the Royal Air Force. And then went down to Farnborough, uh, where I was Flying Services Manager for the Society of British Aerospace Companies. Um, I've also been uh, part of the curatorial team for the National Museum of Science and Industry, running their Rawton Airfield, which contained the National Air Transport Collection. Um, we'll skip over the rest of the 52 years. <laughs> and how did you become involved in this project? Um, a friend of mine put a, um, a plea out on social media uh, saying, it's, uh, it's been some years since we lost the last flying mosquito in Europe in 1996. And, wouldn't it be great if we got a group of people together to make sure that another one came back to European skies? And I raised my hand at this point, and I've been involved ever since. There we go. Well, we're going to take a, a, a look at a, a video which is actually very historically significant uh, before we get into the, the actual presentation. So uh, as, they, uh, as they say, set up this clip for us. Right. What you're about to see is... Uh, extremely rare. Color film from World War II is difficult to find. Color film of any length is, is even rarer. Uh, what you're about to see is an, um, a mission flown by 627 Squadron uh, with their mosquitoes to mark and attack a Luftwaffe airfield in occupied Holland. Uh, it's in September 1944. So the aircraft are in a mix of day camouflage and night camouflage, and you'll cover the whole, and I mean the whole attack, and the recovery back to base. It is absolutely superb, and we were uh, graciously given the chance to uh, turn this into a presentation by the family of the late Flight Lieutenant Harris, uh, who actually shot the film.
Ross, definitely a fascinating uh, piece of history. And as you mentioned, the uh, the shots in uh, certain segments of that that video are very long. Uh, most times, uh, cameras, if you look at old newsreels and things like that, they were using uh, spring uh, wound cameras, which only would shoot 8, 10, 12 seconds. But some of those shots were uh, were incredibly long for the time period. Yes, and I said the rarity of the film, believe it or not, uh, the Germans had uh, easier access with Agfa stock uh, than uh, the British did. But uh, I'm glad to see that you saw all aspects of the uh, planning, uh, the preparation, and uh, the recovery back to base, including, you will note, the one aircraft that actually shot off a red flare for wounded on board, another one that made a very, very good single engine landing. All right. Well, let's get into the People's Mosquito Project itself. Uh, right. How did this, well, how, when, when did this actually start? Um, it really kicked off about uh, 12 years ago. John uh, decided um, to make an appeal, as I said, uh, for, uh, you know, this is what we would like to do. And um, we, we really must consider that the mosquito was unique and that's a, a heavily u overused word but it was uh, superb um jeffrey de Havilland decided that to make the mosquito work he would throw away all the gun turrets and the extra gunners and the, the structure and everything that went w uh, with uh, typical bomber aircraft of the 1930s and uh, 1940s so an unarmed bomber that was faster than a fighter and that could walk away from them whilst delivering a precision bomb load. Um, and he first thought of that in 1939. And the first prototype mosquito flew in November 25th, 1940. This aircraft, and I use the word unique a lot in this case, it is, as far as I'm aware, the only prototype of a major World War II uh, type of fighter or bomber that still exists. In its original place, it was built. Uh, W4050, normally um, prototypes get used as test aircraft, they get heavily modified, they no longer become of a standard that they can be used by a frontline squadron, and they're just scrapped. But this aircraft kept continuously modified right the way through the 1940s. And there it stands in all its glory in the de Havilland uh, uh, Aircraft Museum. Superb aircraft. And it was made in no less than six plants in, in the United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia. Um, over 3,000 at Hatfield, the main uh, works for de Havilland. Uh, nearly 1,500 at Leavesden, which was 12 miles away, a subsidiary factory. Standard Motors in the Midlands made uh, 1,066 of just one type, the FB6. Percival at Luton, Percival Aircraft, now on what is Luton, on Luton London Airport, uh, about 250. Airspeed, um, mostly post-war in Portsmouth. And Broughton, which is now the Air, uh, Airbus factory, um, the last, produced the last Mosquito in November 1950. So 7,781, uh, including production in Canada, more than 1,000 in Australia, just over 200. Let's talk about Here's the uh, assembly a little bit of the, uh, of the mosquito. Oh, the assembly was, was uh, again, um, very different to, to the normal uh, metal monoclock, which was common at that stage. They actually built it rather like a Ravel or Airfix kit. They're both in two halves. You form the fuselage shell like an eggshell on molds, which in those days were actually ship grade mahogany, but in our case, we're having to use a different uh, tropical wood. And um, they were a sandwich construction, monocoque. There was a uh, three ply birch normally, um, eight and a half millimeters of balsa and then another layer of three ply birch making about 11.5 millimeters in total as um, a composite and you let the uh, adhesive set off 
and then you fitted the shells out um, again in two stages on the port side of the fuselage you had most of the electrical runs and the control runs as well too control cables on that side there's obviously the pilot set on that side on the starboard side you had a main hydraulic tank um, uh, air bottles etc and other services and an access hatch right which was very useful um, uh, just for getting people in and out if you were carrying uh, very specialized missions so yeah that's that's the construction you'll notice that many of the workers were, were female that's because of obviously britain had uh, drafted almost every male they could and then also got a female service member so um the preponderance of of uh of women workers in the workforce was was gratefully um accepted by the government because this was the only way they could get things done do you know how long it took from the initial um concept that uh, sir jeffrey had until the, the prototype was was ready to fly um that took around about um something like a year okay. um what happened was that they originally received um a specification from the air ministry um i think it was p1336 uh, for a uh, twin engine bomber that could carry 3000 pounds of bombs for 3000 miles at 270 miles an hour and so jeffrey quickly worked out that this wouldn't work you know like um two pints into into one pint pot doesn't go um the specification couldn't work so he went back to the air minister and said look we believe that we can actually build an unarmed bomber that will actually exceed these speeds and that will be be able to carry you know a thousand pounds of bombs and it will be faster than a spitfire so not many people actually believed him he had one major uh, supporter inside the uh, air ministry uh, air chief marshal sir wilfred freeman uh, who uh, banged the gong for the mosquito everywhere he could so much so that the mosquito became known internally as freeman's folly um, but since he was a director of uh, sorry member for research and development on the air council he had the uh, right under his uh, remit to order a single prototype of any aircraft for research purposes so he went and ordered one mosquito um, and lo and behold the aircraft was so uh, amazingly quick it uh, on its uh, trials down at boscombe down it didn't just occasionally get past a spitfire it actually walked away at 27 miles an hour faster than the fastest aircraft the royal air force had at that stage it, it's um, the first 400 mile an hour aircraft that operationally uh, so yes at that stage all bets were off and the orders flooded in but it needed every single uh woodworker carpenter joiner furniture maker um even undertaker that could people who deal in wood uh, to actually help this so 400 subcontractors um so it was uh, quite amazing how the works workshops were organized all over the country uh, there's a nice shot of some uh, uh, main spars being built um as i said little companies really stepped up big time right an aircraft in walthamstow which is about seven miles due east of the center of london by july 1944 it produced 1000 mosquito fuselages uh, so it was a, it was a national endeavor on a huge scale indeed now as you mentioned the uh the uh, mosquito would not have conventional gunners turrets that, that sort of thing its speed was its was its main weapon but it also did carry some uh, armament as well oh goodness yes and um <laughs> an ever-increasing load actually 
Um, it was designed to carry four 250-pound general purpose bombs, U US, UK style. And um, the design team worked out that if they made telescoping, telescopic tails that were spring-loaded, uh, so that the, the rear portion of the bomb tail vane would spring out after it uh, exited the bomb bay, they could carry four 1,000-pound bombs. Um, so, sorry, um, for two 500-pound uh, bombs. So it doubled the, um, the the weight of shot, so to speak, overnight. The um, research boffins, uh, the establishment, the aircraft uh, and armament establishment weren't very thrilled at this, uh, particularly when they found out that de Havilland uh, had started just cutting the vein in half, reducing its its width. And they say it would never happen. So de Havilland bombed their own airfield with inert bombs and showed that it wasn't a great loss of accuracy. And then uh, someone else decided that, well, if we actually put a, a bulged bomb bay doors on this and a big single point attachment, we can perhaps fit the Royal Air Force's standard 4,000 pound high capacity blast bomb called a colloquially a cookie into the mosquito and what that did it meant that the mozzie could carry a 4,000 pound bomb load to berlin and the average bomb load on a b-17 to berlin was guess how much yeah 4,000 pounds with about a fifth of the crew um and about 150 miles an hour faster so uh, it was a, an incredible load lifter. Indeed. Well, and at this point, with with that with those modifications, um, Sir Jeffrey had just outdone the original uh, specifications from the Royal Air Force, which yeah. was three thousand to go three thousand yeah. miles at two seventy. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but the the real trick came when uh, Eric Bishop, who was the head of the design team down at Salisbury Hall, there. Uh, very, very um, secret design team that were building the in a prototype Mosquito, uh, thought, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to leave enough room underneath the floor of the cockpit to fit four 20 millimeter Hispano cannon in there. Because after all, if you've got a 400 mile an hour bomber, imagine what a 400 mile an hour cannon armed fighter will do. And this thing was incredibly maneuverable. Um, for example, on the um, 12th of April, 1941, General H.H. H. Arnold and his aide, uh, then Major Pete Casada, were treated to a demonstration of uh, American aircraft that Britain was buying, and also the Mosquito at Hatfield Airfield. And um, the, one of the fighter prototypes appeared over the hedge and went down the center line of the grass at 400 miles an hour, then pulled up into upward rolls, then uh, came back inside the circuit and stood it on. It was, uh, it was Jeffrey Harrelson Jr., the chief test pilot. He stood it on its wingtip and inscribed a circle inside the perimeter of the airfield. And it was uh, going so fast that wingtip vortices were crackling off the edges of the wing. And the following day, General Arnold took the specifications back to Washington. So, you know, it was just for 18 months in the middle of the war, it was the fastest operational aircraft on of any of the combatants. Just off the charts. Of course, uh, helping to make that happen is the uh, the uh, power plant, the twin power well, plant. Yes. For the um, if you've got two Rolls-Royce Merlins, yeah. um, putting in about 1,260 horsepower at that stage, of course, they went up considerably higher. Um, and you've got a wetted area uh, on the airframe. That's the area subjected to, uh, to the airflow of about 150% of a Spitfire's wetted area, and you've got twice the power, uh, you're gonna go places fast. It was also very maneuverable. There had been one huge argument against it uh, when uh, 
General Arnold took the plans back to America. He got a consortium of uh, smaller companies together because obviously people like Boeing and Consolidated and everything were, were chock a block with orders under the Roosevelt's plan, you know, for uh, 50,000 warplanes, and of course orders from uh, people like Britain. Um, and Curtis Wright sent a couple of over engineers over to Hatfield. Uh, they were involved in this uh, possible consortia. And Bell, after a short while, came back and said it was a retrograde step and wood's not good enough for a warplane um, because they obviously are thinking about fire risk. Well, it turned out that wood was, uh, strangely enough, less flammable than uh, metal because the metal monocoques uh, tended to, if there was a hydraulic leak or a fuel leak, it just ran down the longer arms and accumulated in pools and caught fire. Um, uh, spruce tends to, to burn less spectacularly, sh shall you say. Um, yeah, it, it was radical in, in many, many ways. And also, um, it had very, very low uh, uh, skin friction. This is because um, the uh, Pieces of ply, birch ply, etc., and spruce were butt jointed on the surface, and then they were covered over with uh, 80 grams per square meter medaplum cotton, occasionally uh, bulked up with linen, uh, and then uh, laid on wet onto red dope, uh, and then sanded, and then another layer of red dope, uh, filling in all the cracks and the screw holes and smoothing things out. So um, then obviously you had uh, aluminium dope for UV protection for the fabric you just laid on, uh, and then two layers of camouflage paint on top of that. But it was uh, really, really smooth and slick. You also notice that the uh, wing has a very uh, forward entry uh, to the airflow. If you look at most twin-engined, uh, say, bomber aircraft like the B-25, the A-20, the wing is set normally, conventionally, in the midpoint of the fuselage. The Mosquito is very far up towards the nose. Admittedly, it's not as bad as the XP-50 was, where the nose initially ended up halfway on the cord of the wing. But, it, it again, everything that Jeffrey and de Havilland could do, and remember, he built re record-breaking aircraft, um, to minimize the drag uh, was done. It also had a, a great variety of armaments. Um, those four 20 millimeter cannon uh, were also supplemented in some of the earlier machines by four 303 Brownings, not as punchy as the 0.5s, but still, you are still carrying around an enormous amount of weight. It's like carrying around um, four 20 millimeter uh, Hispanos from uh, Hurricane 2C and uh, four Brownings from you know, half a Spitfire. It was an enormous weight of shot as the Luftwaffe night fighters found out to their disadvantage. But that wasn't the end of the gun saga by any means. Um, some bright spark decided that um, wouldn't it be really good if we could fit a large caliber auto cannon in the front of this mosquito uh, to attack surface submarines or merchant raiders or high value targets? So um, they approached a company called Molins Limited in Peterborough, um, who are a manufacturer of handling machinery, to see if they could solve the problem of carrying 25 six pounder uh, shells that they were called 57 millimeter anti-tank shells uh, and auto loading them into an anti-tank gun which they did um, and uh, the effect on the germans was incredibly scary uh, for example squad leader phillips was flying this fb mark 18 sometimes called the setsy around the mosquito uh, in a mixed formation of uh, FB6s and FB18s over the Bay of Biscay one day, and they were attacked by a staffel of Junkers 88 uh, day fighters from the Luftwaffe. One of them unfortunately decided to fly in front of squadron, uh, the FB18, 
and uh, a burst of four shells went out, the first of which just tore an engine out, out straight off the wing of the 88, and uh, what was left of it fell into the Bay of Biscay. So I think that was one of the, the highest caliber air-to-air -air kills ever performed. Um, but a good friend of mine, Des Curtis, who was a navigator on one of the uh, Mark 18s, actually was uh, responsible, along with his pilot, for sinking a U-boat that was on the surface with, uh, with this machine. Um, unfortunately, um, uh, a saying comes to mind. Uh, Sir Sidney Cam, the wonderful aircraft designer who gave us the Hurricane, the Tempest, uh, the Typhoon, etc. Uh, he said that an aircraft has four qualities, span, length and height and politics. Unfortunately, the FB-18 ran head on into politics because there was a big internal battle inside Coastal Command about the people who wanted a big gun, uh, the 18, including the CNC Coastal Command, and the people who wanted to carry eight three-inch uh, rocket projectiles under the wing, like the Typhoon did in Normandy. Unfortunately, the rocket uh, guys won out. So only 27 of this incredible uh, variant were built. We did actually donate one to Pax River, actually, um, where it uh, underwent trials with uh, a B-25 that was carrying a 75 millimeter field gun. I think that was the H model, uh, but that was manually loaded. So it could only get a couple of shots off, whereas the uh, FB-18 could just unload uh, the whole magazine firing at one, one shell every 1.1 seconds. Um, but that was towards the end of the war, and again, nothing came of it. Okay, well, we've covered the generation of uh, how we formed the People's Mosquito, and pretty soon we re recognized that we needed charitable status, and we needed uh, a constitution, and all the other good things. And uh, we decided that we were going to be funded by public donations, by sponsorships, and a big shout out to Airbus at this stage, they don't necessarily sponsor us, but they actually support us, and we're allowed to use their logo, and we do lots of uh, cross-pollination. Um, the Heritage Lottery Fund and Legacies, and then the Mosquito was going to be for the United, for the UK and European uh, public. We've uh, got a very strong social media presence, uh, 50,000 plus global reach. We have an excellent uh, Mosquito Club. Um, that and a, a very good website that includes yes we do have merch we have a very great shop you can buy we've got branded clothing of course everybody does and uh, some unique mosquito items uh, we also like our motto very much to fly to educate to remember and we involve veterans as much as we can uh, in our events um, so the team is, uh, we have a patron, Arthur Williams, then John, who's chairman and managing director, myself. We've got an excellent director of operations, Wing Commander Bill Ramsey, RAF. Bill was the boss of the Red Arrows, officer commanding, and he was also a staff pilot on the Battle of Britain Memorial flight on Lancaster and Dakota. An excellent commercial director in Steve Manning, director of finance, Alan Pickford. And uh, patron in memorial also is Captain Eric uh, Winkle Brown. We acquired mortal remains from a crashed mosquito, Romeo Lima 249. And uh, you can see some of them there, including the flash hiders. They're the only pieces that are likely to be used on the restoration. Uh, wing rib construction initially started out in New Zealand, a company called Aerowood. Uh, but unfortunately, they went bankrupt and uh, uh, we acquired all their jigs and fixtures, thank goodness. But the real boost when we, just, we were gifted uh, 22,300 original drawings for the Mosquito, which had been found in a filing cabinet. And some poor person had to 
survey this lot and correlate them. And I didn't have any white hair before that. Uh, it took me <laughs> three and a half months. Um, so, as I said, we got all this lovely stuff from New Zealand, which we unpacked, and we contracted with the one of the very best restoration companies um, there is, called Retrotech. Guy Black has been uh, a friend of mine for more than 40 years, and he really turned out some absolutely fabulous aircraft. Um, this is the start of our new UK mold. Um, we can't use mahogany for the mold. We use jelutong, which is another uh, tropical uh, wood. It hasn't got quite the crushed uh, standard of mahogany, but it's quite capable of standing up to the job. And we were very fortunate in that we received a royal visit in November. And there you see Princess Anne, the Princess Royal, down at Retrotech, where the work is taking place. And uh, I've got my best tie on there, um, showing us one of the drawings. But you can see Steve in the foreground, our commercial manager, and there's uh, Ian Homer, our uh, director of PR, Dawn Butterworth. Um, she's part of our subsidiary, the Wooden Wonder Trading Limited. And Mark, who is uh, again the managing director of uh, WWTL. So we were there in en masse, so to speak. There is George Dunn, a fabulous photograph. George, a friend of mine, a friend of all of us, wants to get this project going as, as soon as he can. He's shaking hands, having given his book that he wrote to Princess Anne. George, DFC, and uh, he did a tour on Halifax before he actually met up with the Mosquito. He's 101. Uh, which is, is, is quite amazing. And that's a test piece being slid into the mold by Paul Coles. Uh, he's uh, one of the chief woodworkers down there. And Princess Anne is looking on to see how it's done. We're still acquiring parts. For those of you who are actually watching the presentation, there's a something in the top left-hand corner that you will recognize if you own a P-51. Uh, that's a header tank from a Merlin, and uh, it's, uh, excuse me one second. And um, it's, uh, it's just staggeringly um, good to see that. The um, other parts that we've collected, including a spinner, which was found in a children's playground, uh, we bought a, a B-26, uh, sorry, an FB-26 uh, control column from Canada. Uh, Siamese ports, uh, we need two sets of those for uh, exhaust five and six position. And we bought a throttle quadrant. So the current status, we've got the final compilation of the fuselage molds in process, the first molds for 73 years. Uh, we've got a fundraising campaign. We're about to start Operation Overlord. Um, I would point everybody in the direction of our web page. And uh, the Retrotech holds them both manufacturing design and maintenance accreditation from the CAA. So um, they are absolutely top notch. And as I said, we actually have um, a wonderful biannual club journal called Mozzie Bites which comes out, as I said, twice yearly. Um, it comes free with your membership. Uh, it costs about 40 bucks to become a member of the club. And uh, if you want to become a life member, it'll cost you about $420. But you get Mozzie Bites. There's only one thing wrong with Mozzie Bites, is that you occasionally have to read what I've written. But uh, I'm sure we'll all come to, come to get used to that in the end. And to show why we chose Retrotech, that is a photograph of the first takeoff of the de Havilland DH9 that took Guy Black 20 years to restore. And it's the world's only original World War I bomber flying. And the man is an absolute genius. So there we are, the de Havilland Mosquito DH98. Um, it's a wonderful aircraft, and we're pushing as hard as we can to get this thing in the air. 
um, one thing I would say is that we just haven't had enough time. So I'd like very much to come back to you guys and say, why don't we have a look at the United States uh, Army Air Force's use of the Mosquito in World War II, including the uh, US's first night fighter ace. Yes. So there we are. <laughs> we will, we will schedule that. We will schedule that for a, a future word or two. Um, it's just been it's been fascinating so far uh, listening to uh, you uh, and finding out more about the people's mosquito. Uh, but right now we are going to turn things over and uh, get some audience questions, and uh, we'll continue our conversation in just a moment. Well, it, you know, what, what a fascinating time that we spent together. And you're right, there is there is so much more to to cover and. Uh, like I said, we are going to uh, schedule a follow-up. We, we can talk about the uh, the mosquito in the uh, U.S. Army Air Corps uh, story. I didn't know about until tonight, so we'll we'll, uh, we'll let you know when that that show is coming. But when we get back to this one, um, some questions that uh, that came in during the presentation. Uh, Mark is wondering, as he was looking at the the uh, the historic film, what airfield was that? Where where were those aircraft based? And is that airfield still active? Uh, the answer is um, that unfortunately it isn't. It was the home base of 617 as opposed to 627 as well. In other words, they shared an airfield with the Dam Busters. Uh, and that's in, it was in Lincolnshire. And unfortunately, it is not active anymore. Um, there's a very nice hotel near it, by the way, and a, a monument to 617. Um, one little, you probably, if you were very, very quick, you saw a flash, just one frame, about a second on that film. In the distance, there was a Lancaster transiting from right to left in the, in the far distance. Um, and rumor has it that when the first 12,000 pound tall boy bombs arrived, uh, the huge bomb trailers um, at the airfield, they were literally um, accosted by uh, horrified ground crew from 627 saying my god you don't want us to carry those do you <laughs> but no um interestingly there was a bit of cross fertilization between 617 and 627 when it came to the mosquito because 627 617 were very um independent minded and they like to do their own marking sometimes so at one time or other, uh, six, uh, two, uh, 617 ran six different mosquitoes, including a couple of FB6s. And uh, Leonard Cheshire VC, uh, although the mosquito wasn't mentioned in, in the citation for his VC, he actually uh, was marking below the bomb carpet at night over Munich in a mosquito. The bomb fall was taking place around him. He got a VC. I'm not surprised. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what, the people's mosquito, what variant of the mosquito will it be? Ah, we're boxing clever here. It's um, going to be built as an FB6, which was the made of all work, the one they built most of. However, um, we're going to make it convertible in that by removing one nose panel, the gun panel, and changing it out, you can turn it to an FB-18. Um, you'll have a dummy barrel for the 57 millimeter. Uh, you can also add wingtip aerials and a what's known as a bow and arrow radar aerial at the front in the nose, paint it all black, and you've got yourself an NF-2. Um, you can also turn it into a T-3 trainer. Uh, and some very obscure types. You can do a prototype sea mosquito, uh, and you'll also be able to do uh, one of only two conversions for a target tug FB6, which the Belgian Air Force did on their own. So oh, yes. we, we estimate that we can actually turn out 11 different variations by some simple changes. The main problem lies in the fact that um, although this will keep it very fresh, there'll be a, a constant change of camouflage scheme and serials, etc. 
just like the Battle of Britain Memorial flight, we're stealing their good ideas. Um, the problem lies in the fact that if you want to re, you need a complete repaint, and you can't just keep adding layers of paint on a mozzie. Uh, you have to strip it down. Uh, for example, if you made a mistake uh, on the rudder and you've already got two coats of paint on it, you can't just add an extra layer of paint because the weight of doing that is sufficient to actually put the rudder out of trim. You actually have to strip it down and put, you know, start again from scratch. And the cost of doing that, you probably need to get a sponsor to do that in the, the downtime in winter. Um, the, uh, the the airplane that you're restoring, where did that originally come from? Uh, that actually came uh, from 23 Squadron. Uh, it's a, a, a night, It started out life as a night fighter, an NF-36, uh, which is the last mark of Mosquito night fighter that the RAF took into service. The first NF-36 was a conversion of the NF-30, and it actually flew uh, in World War II. Uh, the prototype, uh, but they were issued post-war to night fighter stations, night fighter squadrons, whilst everyone was waiting for the uh, new night fighter jets to arrive. Uh, in this case, um, de Havilland turned out a two-seat night fighter uh, on, based on their uh, T-10 night trainer, uh, jet trainer. Um, and Gloucester turned out a very respectable night fighter based on the Meteor. But whilst there was this transition period and the NF-36 had to sort of face the threat of possible war pack aircraft that coming across at night, um, the aircraft itself was rare in that, yes, it did crash on takeoff at night during a, a training sortie, um, it went in a field just off Royal Air Force Coltishall in Norfolk. Um, and it, the why it was rare, it was actually subject of a gallantry award. Um, the pilot managed to break his way out of the aircraft and he thought he heard his navigator calling him and assumed he was outside of the aircraft too. He wasn't. He was inside and on fire. So the pilot broke into the aircraft again and dragged his navigator clear. And for this, he actually got the conspicuous gallantry medal. A, a very, very, it's the, one of the highest awards you can receive in peacetime for gallantry, a very rare award indeed. The pilot survived, but unfortunately his navigator died later in hospital. So uh, yes, it, we have this uh, completely documented and we have the squadron record books, etc., book, etc., and of course the write-up that uh, took place in several newspapers in the following days. So, um, in case people say, "Well, you can't start out with an NF-36 and with an F-6," you can, um, because it's basically just a change of nose. And uh, De Havilland themselves actually used to change uh, bits of aircraft all the time to get a different mark. For example, uh, when the Junkers JU-86, not the 87, the 86P, the pressurized version with diesel engines of this very staid looking twin engine bomber, uh, started appearing over Britain in single uh, sorties at 42 and 43 and even 45,000 feet. The Royal Air Force couldn't even reach them. So de Havilland, inside seven days, cut the nose off the prototype pressurized PR uh, B, um, uh, bomber, uh, the Mark 16 bomber that was going to come into service. Uh, did a drastic weight reduction exercise to include swapping out the wheels uh, to a, a smaller version on one of their, their B, uh, de Havilland uh, Flamingo aircraft and uh, fitted it out with a gun pack of just four 303 Brownings. And it flew and it reached 45,000 feet. And <laughs> the team at de Havilland, I can't speak more highly of them, they were absolutely genius when it comes to repurposing things. Going through the drawings, you would find things like 
the to the the towing bar isn't from isn't designed for a mosquito it's straight from a de Havilland flamingo um the aileron hinges right started out life i think on a dragon rapide um fuel filler cap again from from another de Havilland. We found drawings that were used on the mosquito from the DH-60 moth, the DH-82 tiger moth, if, and it carries on through the whole of the Havilland structure. If you look at the tail wheel of a mosquito, it's got a particular type of construction. Well, the, the one it evolved into, it's called a Dunlop uh, Marstrand twin track tail wheel. It's got a high ridged, hard rubber um, outer flange on both sides of, of the tire. And it's an anti-shimmy device. You then go and look at, at the nose wheel on a de Havilland vampire jet finder, jet fighter, and guess what it is? It's exactly the same tire. De Havilland's repurposed everything. Why why redesign the wheel? You know, right. literally. Yeah. Uh, so before we came on the air, you asked me uh, what was my favorite warbird. But I'm going to yes. turn the tables on you and ask Oof. you. Um, what your favorite book or books are, one of our viewers wants to know, on the mosquito, if you were going to recommend uh, some books for people to read. If, if I were going to, were going to recommend a, a book on the mosquito, just one, and uh, on the type of mosquito that we're at, excuse me, I've got over 150 books uh, on mosquitoes here. Let me just see if we can dig one out for you. Uh, While he's uh, pulling up the book, the uh, the links that you see on the screen, uh, the website, we the uh, Retro uh, um, Tech website, and if you have uh, other questions that we might not get to tonight or you think of later on, info at peoplesmosquito.org.uk. Uh, email Ross. I, I think that I would recommend Combat Legend, De Havilland Mosquito by Robert Jackson. Um, okay. This is, is a small book, but it is stuffed full of absolutely fabulous photographs and write-ups on the evolution of, of the De Havilland Mosquito. And it's also got a very, very nice color section. And notice the nice uh, United States Air Force markings on some of these. So Amazing. if I was just going to say get one book to break in on a mosquito, right? Uh, it's got survivors. It's got production. Uh, yeah, you can get very thick books on mosquitoes, trust me. Mm -hmm. But this little thing, it's by Air Life Books. Um, it's about 14.95 in the U.S., and you can't really go wrong with it. So as a, as a starter for 10, yes. If you want Good. to get very heavy, and I mean very heavy, oh. <laughs> this is regarded as a standard work by Martin Sharp, no relation, not plugging, and Michael Bowyer. It's just called Mosquito, and it's got a forward by Jeffrey D. Havland. But um, like I said, I've got books in... Uh, Polish, Japanese, Italian. Um, this is just one of the, the working book racks you can see. Oh, lots more behind you in all different kinds of directions. Um, it's, it, yeah, it is. Have you worked with uh, Avspec in uh, New Zealand? Um, in we have had lots of contact with Warren. Indeed, our first um, thought when we went uh, uh, to build this aircraft was to contract with Avspecs. However, um, the problem is is two things. One of them is legal, uh, and the other one is financial. Uh, legal, legally, strangely enough, um, part of my life when I was uh, I don't know, a real aviation person um, was to deal with the Civil Aviation Authority. I actually and I haven't mentioned this because it's very boring. I had a seat on both the technical and general aviation committees of the UK Airport Operators Association. And uh, so you, you tend to cross swords with the CAA fairly regularly at that point in time. 
and um, John and I actually had a meeting, John Lilly, our CEO and I, we went down to the Civil Aviation Authority uh, and had a, a fairly big conference with the head of the safety regulation group, as it then was, they've changed the name since, head of aviation law, head of uh, material sciences, head of propulsion, and they all just sat around us. And we'd prepared this presentation and we'd handed around papers and we thought, well, this is going to be quite fun because the chairman walked in and he plonked down um, CAP 553, uh, which is the BCAR regulations for construction, maintenance and use of an aircraft on the British register in British airspace. And it's around about eight inches thick. It's utterly frightening. <laughs> and he plopped it down in front of him. Anyway, this, this meeting went on for about two hours. and. Uh, at the end, he suddenly stood up, and I thought, oh, dear. And one of the nicest things that happened to me in my professional life, he actually tapped the front of BCR 553 and CAP 553 and said, you will notice, gentlemen, I didn't have to open that once. You'll be hearing from us. And John and I went out and had a, an extremely liquid lunch at that point in time. Yes, we knew that we were in, but that was actually predicated on having it built in New Zealand because strangely enough, there's a reciprocity, automatic reciprocity between the FAA and CAA. In other words, if the FAA approves something, the CAA automatically approves something. Strangely enough, there isn't automatic reciprocity, you would think there would be even easier, between the Civil Aviation Authority of New Zealand and our CAA. Every single aircraft is on a case-by-case -case basis. Every importation of every aircraft from New Zealand, whether it's a Glossair Tula or a Fletcher or whatever, it's on a one-time basis. And ideally, we would have, the CAA wanted us to pay the cost of flying a CAA engineer out there regularly to approve stages of build and watch things like boxing up the wing and so on and so forth. Um, and we worked out that would cost a heck of a lot of money, to put it mildly. Uh, also, by having it built abroad, it cut off access for us to certain types of funding, such as the Heritage Lottery Fund, which is a very big component over here. Um, you know, money is raised from lotteries, as you know, state lotteries in the States. Well, there's a national one here, and it goes out to heritage projects. Um, but heritage projects built in this country, in the UK. So we would be cutting ourselves off from potentially a very big chunk of funding. So yes, that's why we um, were wondering how we were going to manage this until suddenly um, we were given this 22,300 uh, images of drawings. And we recognize we can flip the coin and now do the build in the UK. So that's how it happened. There you go. Are, it, and along with AVSPEC, are you in contact with other uh, mosquito operators oh, like the goodness, Military yeah, Aviation Museum? Yeah. I'm, I'm good friends with Richard DeBurr, who is the doyen of mosquito rebuilds in Canada. He's a lovely, lovely man. And uh, they're going on great guns uh, with the restoration of uh, a PR-35 as pretty uh, run by Spartan Aircraft. Spartan Air Services, rather, as a survey aircraft in Canada, um, and that's going that's going to be some build. I kid you not, really is. Yeah. And, and speaking of of Canada, uh, one of our viewers, Richard, uh, put this comment in. He said, "I was blessed to see a Canadian de Havilland make uh, made mosquito fly an RCAF uh, aerobatic display on VE Day." Uh, in 1945, incredible chandelles flown skyward from a very low pass over a bridge. So that's, that's quite yeah. a memory, Richard. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Yeah, the, the, there's um, the rather tragic case of F for Freddy. The, you know, it was very unusual for uh, a mosquito or a B-25 to reach 100 missions. Mm -hmm. It was even rare. Uh, for Lancasters, which were you know, the, the doyen of night bombers and heavy bombers, to reach 100. Quite a number of mosquitoes reached 200 missions. 
yes. And the, the record holder was uh, uh, one marked F for Freddie. And um, it, it had in excess of 200 missions. And the crew were given permission to fly this thing back and do a bond tour in Canada. And unfortunately, they hit the radio mast on an airfield and they were both killed. So, yeah, um, we have a, a, the greatest of respect for the Canadians. They produced magnificent uh, mosquitoes. They all used, with, without exception, um, Packard built Merlins. Yes. And many of them were flown across the Atlantic on delivery uh, to bomber squadrons in the United Kingdom. As a matter of fact, Guy Gibson VC was killed in a, um, a Canadian-built bomber uh, when he was coming back from being master bomber. He crashed uh, in Holland and was killed along with his navigator. But no, the, the Canadians built great, great aircraft. But we mustn't forget that the United States had a hand in this. Uh, Boeing in Vancouver, their subsidiary in Vancouver, built uh, almost every ta uh, tail unit, the tailplane, uh, vertical fin, rudder, elevators, um, and they were shipped to the other side of the continent. Um, General Motors division in Canada built fuselages. Uh, Kelvinator uh, built parts. A lot of US companies, and of course, we mustn't forget Packard themselves turning out uh, engines. Um, I'm going to men mention a controversial subject here Ford. Okay. I, I used to drive Fords when I was over here. I'd, I'd, I've, got, I've broken the habit. But uh, what happened was that um, the Ford company were approached and Henry Ford refused point blank. Absolutely. Didn't want to know about building Merlin engines for the British. But his uh, UK subsidiary in Manchester said, yes, we'll do that. So they turned out approximately 40% of what Packard did over here in the UK. And the engines, according to Sir Stanley Hooker, the uh, chief engineer of Rolls-Royce, the damn good engines, he said. And they went into some of those went into uh, into mosquitoes, and I've actually got a photograph. I visited the very last Ford produced Merlin engine, which is on display. Amazing. Well, Ross, it has been a, a fascinating hour plus, <laughs> and we have we have more to talk about, and we're going to talk about mosquitoes uh, in the United States uh, with the uh, Army Air Force during World War II. That's uh, a show that we're going to schedule, and I, I think we're going to. If it's okay with you, I think we might uh, put you into our regular rotation, uh, especially Please if, do. as um, an overseas I, correspondent. <laughs> I've um, yes, I, I've already uh, done that. You know, I'm I'm blessed in that I'm part of the official um, um, British uh, body, the uh, part of uh, so is the the People's Mosquito. We're members of AHUK, uh, formerly known as the British Aircraft Preservation Council. I used to sit on its board back in the day, and uh, I'm still an avid participant and go regularly to other museums, so and air shows when I'm not working and manufacturers. So yes, by all means, I'll sit on the I'll ride the pine in the dugout. Um, that's a baseball analogy for you, <laughs> mainly because I'm going to let you into a small tiny secret here. All right. My late father-in-law, as well as being on a B-24 unit in the MTO, played for the Yankees. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, he, was, he was in the, uh, in the, the farm system uh, down south when just then war broke out, and he never went back. But no, Louis J. Baton played for the Yanks. And oh, he actually cool. played in a scratch game against Lou Gehrig on the other side. But, wow. Anyway, so I'm yeah I'm a, I'm a closet baseball fan, so there you are. Good, good. Well, again, thank you for joining us, and uh, I will I look forward to uh, our next show. We'll get that on the schedule and let everyone know. And 
thanks to uh, all of you who were uh, stuck with us tonight, asked questions. I hope you uh, enjoyed the, the program. Again, if you would like uh, to help us out, just hit that like button and uh, share our Word, Word 2 videos. If you subscribe on YouTube, click the bell icon. You'll get uh, notifications when our new shows uh, are posted. All right. If you have any uh, input or feedback on this show or any of our shows or something you'd like us to cover in the future, just send Leah Black an email at media at cafhq.org. Until the next time, I'm Steve Buss from the Commemorative Air Force. Thanks for joining us. Have a good night.